Okay. Um, hey, Mr. Commissioner, uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. We're good. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't think, if I agree with you, I don't think I have to file an ex parte uh, anyway. Um, let me just say at the outset, um, it's been a long time since I've held myself out as a lawyer, unlike everybody else on this panel. So I'm going to come at this uh, really from a marketplace and business perspective, uh, although you can't uh, in this town talk about anything without thinking about the implications of, of policy on the business. Um, and try to uh, draw some, some strands from, from uh, Commissioner McDowell's remarks together. Um, imagine two worlds. The first world is a world where after the commercialization of the internet, uh, people in a garage came up with something called an internet browser and launched it, changed the face of how we use the World Wide Web. Telecommunications industries across the country uh, uh, started providing what was then dial-up ISP service. By the year 2000, the cable industry led the way in terms of the rollout of broadband across America, matched then by the telephone companies with what was then DSL broadband service and now with Verizon, Verizon's Fios service. And in that span of time, um, the, the contribution to the economy of the internet and commercialization of the internet became an extraordinary thing. With advent, advent of broadband, uh, something else took place, which is it, it affected how we interacted with each other. So in addition to just the selling of goods and services, we had something called a social networking site uh, and many, many, many other creative models that changed the way we interact with each other, how we influence policy, how we engage in public discourse, all of these things took place against a backdrop of market capitalizations. If you just took Google, who went again from the proverbial guys in the garage in the space of five years to perhaps a larger market capitalization than the rest of the world combined. And that's to say nothing of all of the other big applications providers who provide goods and services that every one of us in this room uses. And in that world, Imagine that the entire time ISPs, internet service providers, were unregulated. That's the world we have. Imagine another world. Imagine a world where after commercialization of the internet, and when I say commercialization, I'm talking about the transfer from the original, the origins of, of DARPA and the original internet um, to what we uh, freely access and use today. And imagine a world where you had a bunch of toll roads uh, where you had content providers and applications providers and ISPs who basically had gated communities. You had to pay to be in. You couldn't access any services or content or applications that weren't provided by that ISP. They controlled everything you did. You were not, unlike World One, able to freely access every service, application, and content on the web to your heart's content. That is the world that is described by my friends, Gigi and Marvin. This is sort of a serial debate that we've been having for three years. Um, and I hate going first, but um, <laughs> that world does not exist. But that's the world that's being described as speculative harm to justify why we need something called net neutrality regulation, which means many, many different things to many, many different people but in essence is some variation of economic regulation over the pricing and marketing and services provided by internet service providers to their customers. I'm not going to take my full five minutes. My thesis statement, as it were, is simply this, that for the reasons that Rob identified, both in terms of statutory authority or the Constitution, and it's been a long time since I've even thought about the Administrative Procedures Act, thank God, but I do believe it still calls for, <laughs> it still calls for reasoned decision making. There still has to be a problem that then is responded to by either the statute, the regulation, um, and then and when you layer on on top as a First Amendment speaker that we would, we would call ourselves out as all of the constitutional hurdles uh, that ought to come to bear when you're talking about controlling essentially the editorial decisions of cable operators or phone companies or any other internet service provider. The bar is very high. So when you match the speculative harm 
to the consequences, but also the legal realities. Uh, this is the classic, and I know this drives you crazy, but this is the classic solution in search of a problem. 